I'm just waiting for the resonant frequency of the system to see how long it takes to settle down. At the okay. All right, so let's start. So today we are going to uh, start with graph theory, with graphs. And um, well, there are two reasons to do that. One has to do with two buzzwords. Okay, so I'm sure you've, you've, you've learned about this in 61A. And one of the most important things in computer science is abstraction. Okay. Um, how many of you he have heard about this buzzword, big data? Yeah, some people have heard about it. Yeah. Uh, does it, anyone know what it means? Big money. Yeah. Large big data. Large big data. <laughs> I, w I was I was afraid somebody would say jobs. It means jobs. <laughs> okay, but uh, no, no. Okay, so big data is it's all the buzzword these days. You know, everybody's into it and. Um, Everybody has their interpretation about what it means. But, but um, you know, it's about um, the fact that there are, you know, there are many, many contexts in which you can generate lots of data, and then you want to analyze it and do something with it, and there seems to be an enormous opportunity to, to do something interesting with it. Well, one of the, you know, one of the things that w what graphs do is it's a, it's a, you know, it's this formalism, it's one of the primary formalisms with which we abstract. And especially when you have a lot of data, that's what you do. So, you know, you can think of graphs as one of, the, one of our primary ways of, of dealing with uh, big data and then, you know, abstracting out from big, big data and finding interesting patterns in them. Okay? Um, uh, um, so that's one reason we are, we are talking about graphs. The second reason we are talking about graphs is because when you work with them, the natural way to work with them, if you want to, if you want to understand them, is to use induction. Okay, so rather than talk about you know sort of um, toy problems with, about induction, we are just going to step right into graphs, and th that that'll give us a playground in which we'll explore induction as well while doing something useful. Okay? So that that's that's our that's our that's our purpose here. Okay, so. So I think it was about, was it a year ago, a year and a half ago, maybe? Uh, I think it was towards the end of 2013 that the EU announced, uh, they, they made a major announcement about brain science, you know, about, about neuroscience. And one, one, of, my, one of my colleagues, uh, sort of, who, is, um, who has a particular turn of phrase, uh, he was giving a talk and he said, well, the headline could well have been that EU just announced that it's going to purchase a giant graph for 1.2 billion euros. Okay, so what, what did the EU actually announce? So what they, what they announced is that they wanted to create a map of the, of the human brain. Okay, so what does it mean, a map? Okay, and they, they, they sort of announced that they would spend 1.2 billion euros, which is, which is closer to $2 billion over the, over the next 10 years. That's a lot of money. And, um, you know, and that once they created this map of the brain, it was, it was sort of like the human genome project, except it was instead of understanding the genome, now they were trying to understand the brain. But, but why is it a graph? Okay, so, well, you know what, what, the, what the brain looks like. It it's cons consists of neurons, which uh, e each neuron sort of has a has an axion, and then there are, the, are these uh, dendrites, you know, which you can think of as wires, which, which go out from that. And, and then, uh, you know, you might have other neurons, and, and there are connections, which are called synapses. You know, that's where, the, that's where the connections in these circuits happen. And so what it means to create a map of the brain is you think, you, you sort of abstract this out. You know, there's a, there's a lot of chemistry and biology and biochemistry that goes on in here, and if you want to understand the details of it, it's, it's really complicated, okay? But then, what they want to uh, do in this, with this map of the brain is try to understand how does it compute, right? How does it actually function? How do we think? What, you know, what are the different centers, and how are they, you know, how are, how are in, 
how a signal is going across and uh, you know where is the computation actually happening and what what's the style of it okay and they're hoping that by by building a very detailed map they'll try they'll actually make a huge step forward in understanding this okay so but what does this map look like so that's where you really need to abstract you know if you look at even one of these neurons to understand it is you know that's that's well beyond where we are today so that's already a big big task but what they want to do is actually abstract this out and say look this is just you know think of each of these each of these um what we're going to do is represent each of these neurons by a little circle okay so there's a little circle that's a little circle right maybe there's another neuron here that's a little circle and then this one has these dendrites that go out so maybe it it has one that goes here so we'll just put represent the, that by a line and uh, in fact it's directional because the synapse is on that end and you know it's not symmetrical so you put an arrow here okay and similarly you you might have one that goes like this so you put an arrow there right and so now it's a big graph because there are something like 10 to the 10 of these little circles in it and there are even more of these edges in it you know these lines and what 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 the map means is you actually chart it out and you 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 represent all these 10 to the 10 little circles and and you put down all these lines the way they exist and put the arrows down and at the end of the day you have this giant map which you've purchased for 1.2 trillion dollars and you hope that gives you insight into how the computations happening okay it's an abstraction right i mean it seems it seems like a complicated object but the brain is much much more complicated than that and the hope is that this object will really explain something to us okay that's one place where graphs come up here's another place where it comes up there's there's something called the web graph okay what's the web graph well it also has circles like this here what the circles represent is web pages okay so you have you have one such circle for each web page okay now you know it's a huge graph right there are lots and lots of web pages out there okay so who creates this graph it's a web crawler right a crawling en- engine it it goes out every so often i don't know if it's every day or every week you know google sends out these you know so does each of the you know yahoo sends them out and they create their web you know their their map of the web which is this okay what is it well what it is is what are these what are these lines here well they are pointers right every time you have a link pointing from this web page to that you put in put in that link that's a pointer right you put in an put in this line with a point with an edge with a arrow saying this one points to that well maybe maybe this one also points to that right actually maybe this one points back as well right that's fine they are there all these links right these links are virtual they are you know these are these represent something they are relationship between these web pages now turns out this understanding this this graph is crucial so about 15 or 20 years ago before google became famous there was a search engine called alta vista okay that was the ve- the search engine to use because they had figured out how to how to search extremely well based on the content of the web page the the words that occur right not understanding the words but just the set of words that occur on the web page and analyzing them and based on that answering your queries and saying which is the most relevant which are the most relevant web pages for your search now unfortunately what happens on the on the on the internet is it's sort of an arms race right because you have an algorithm that works well and then after a while it starts getting spammed there was a particularly simple algorithm it got spammed relatively quickly well you know it it lasted a little while because it was early days of the internet but after a few years what happened is no matter what you were searching for you tended to find web pages that related to only one topic you could probably guess which one <laughs> and the reason you found only only web pages rel- related to that topic is because those web pages would contain what they did in graphic detail and then near the bottom they would have a list of all the words in the dictionary 
you know? White on white or black on black, whatever the background color was. So you couldn't even see those words <laughs> displayed. But, uh, but they were in there. So, you know, Alta Vista was being spammed. And the thought was, there was no way around it. You know, there was nothing you could do, because how could you prevent spamming? So what was the big idea that led, to, led around this? Well, there were, there were two ideas that occurred simultaneously, but one of them, and they were both somewhat equivalent, you know, in some formal sense they were about equivalent, except that one of them was maybe, you know, a little bit easier to, you know, okay, so one of them, the one you probably may have heard of is called page rank. It's a little bit of a pun, because page rank for page, ranking the pages, and page rank for Larry Page. Right? This was the algorithm that Google used. And what it was based on is the fact that you, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can figure out search by not only looking at the content of the web pages, the, the words that occur on the web page, but also by looking at the structure of the web graph. Right? Because, you see, legitimate web pages, sort of, they are well-connected. You know, they're well connected to other legitimate web pages, right? So, in other words, you know, they, they, they form this structure sort of uh, in, in some natural way. Where somebody who wants to spam, well, they could, you know, they could, they could build up, a, build up their, their web page with lots of content in it, you know, all the words in the dictionary. They can even point to a lot of stuff, but they can't get these legitimate users to point to them unless, unless they are really interested. And so page rank is an algorithm which maybe, you know, maybe someday in this, uh, you know, if I have time, I can even describe to you what it looks like. How many people know what page rank looks like? People do know. Okay, good. So, so there's, there's an algorithm which is, which is very simple, which, you know, which involves sort of walking in this graph, you know, so just, just jumping around, in the, you know, just walking around in this graph and based on that, ranking all the web pages. Okay. So this was initially Google's claim to fame. This is what got them through the first so many years. And this is sort of the basics of where, where, their, where their search algorithm comes from. Of course, you know, as I said, it's, a, it's an arms race, so you have to keep ahead of the spammers. And so Google always has to sort of take this basic algorithm and then put in bells and whistles to make sure that it still stays ahead of the game. Okay? So that's another place where, where this web graph comes in. One more place where the web graph comes in is in, is in understanding web communities. Okay, so once you have data like this about who's connected to whom, what it does is it takes information that you would normally, you know, that would normally be nebulous. Who, you know, it's, it's sort of the subject of, um, you know, how well you know society and how well you are following the gossip and so on, who's, who's related to whom and in what way. But now it's all right there. You know, it's, it's, it's laid out on, on the table for you to, to dissect in a way that wasn't possible before. But now the amount of data here is enormous. So how do you take this and figure out what the communities are and automatically do it, right? turns out that there are algorithms for doing that. And again, you know, there's this abstraction which allows you to get at it, get at this data. And this is the sort of big data that people want to get at. You, know, you, have, you have all this data, you want, to, you want to get interesting data out of it. You, know, you want to identify communities, often for sort of crass reasons, like you want to advertise to them, or you want to sell them something. But, 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 but also for other, other reasons. You, know, you, you, you want to reach communities that are that are danger or something like that. Okay. So these are examples, some of the examples of graphs. Um, here's, here's another example of a graph. So you're, you're, creating, you're creating a timetable. You're, you're trying to schedule classes. Okay. And um, well, you're, you're, you're trying to schedule classes in such a way, you know, you have only so many classrooms. You want to make sure that you know, you minimize the number of conflicts between classes, okay? So, so you, you want to create a timetable, you have, you have conflicts between certain events because people can't take them simultaneously, you know, because, um, you know, they are supposed to be taken by the same people, so, um, 
So, well, you, you, you think of those courses as, again, your, your little circles. And you have a line between two of them if they cannot be, you know, if, if somebody needs to take both of these classes, well, you'd better not schedule them at the same time. Okay? So maybe, maybe you, have, you, have, um, you have something like that. You have, um, you have something like that. Okay, that's, that's your graph. And now, what are you trying to do? Well, you're trying to assign, you know, assign a time slot for each one. So you could think of it as assigning a color to each one. Right? But, but you can't assign these two the same time slot. Right? So you're, you're assigning colors, uh, red, blue, black, etc. So you want to assign red to this, but you can't assign red to that because there's a conflict between them. So you assign blue to this one. You can't assign the same color here, so yellow. But now you can reuse blue, maybe you can reuse yellow, etc. So you want to, you have, you have the minimum number of time slots within which you want to schedule all of these, and that's how you create a. So, so it's a coloring problem on this, on this graph, right? So again, you know, what the graph represents is abstract relationships between these objects, and then, then you try to express the problem that you are trying to solve. There's another way you can use graphs, which is, you design graphs for a certain purpose. So for example, you're trying to implement a, a parallel uh, machine you know, with many, many processors. <coughs> okay. And OK, so maybe you know, once upon a time, there were people who were trying to build a, who, who, there, there was a company called Thinking Machines, which, which built a computer with 64,000 processors. Okay. So you have these 64,000 processors, which are working in parallel, and they, you know, they, are, they are cooperatively trying to solve a problem. And they need to pass messages back and forth you know, to, to sort of coordinate with each other. But now, of course, you cannot connect every, every, every one of these processors to every other one. Because then you will just, you, you will just strangle the entire computer with wires. It's just not possible to fit in so many wires. So what you want to do is you want to design a network where, again, these circles are the processors. And you want to arrange them in some way. And then these lines are wires between them. These are the direct hops. These are the processes that talk directly to each other. Okay, so you might have some connection pattern like this, you know, hopefully cleverer than this. Okay, but, but you have some connection pattern. And now, if this processor wants to talk to that one, it's going to sort of say, excuse me, could you pass this message on further? And this one passes it on further, and so on, and so on, until it gets there. Okay, meanwhile, Maybe, maybe this processor wants to talk to that one. Well, so, um, so it's going to say the same thing. Well, it's going to say, well, excuse me, do you mind passing this on? And it does. OK, but then in the process, what happens is you have wires which get congested. And so you know, this message has got to wait for that one to go through, or <laughs> vice versa. And of course, what you want to do is design the network in such a way that you don't have messages waiting around. Because if you do, then there's no point having these parallel processes because you get swamped with the waiting time for all the messages. So there's a design problem here. What kind of network should you use? So what are the properties of a graph which ensures that you can pass these messages along quickly, no matter what the message pattern is? Okay. So in the next lecture, we'll see how, how to actually solve this problem. And there's, a, there's a beautiful solution to this which is actually the one that the connection machine used. OK, okay so that's, that's, what, that's what graphs are useful for. That's, that's why we are studying them. OK, um, questions? So the problem we want to solve here is, you know, we have a large number of these, these processors, circles. And we want to connect them up using not too many of these wires in such a way that no matter what, what, um, what pattern of communication we want between the processors, we don't have congestion. You know, we don't have some bottleneck edges where lots and lots of messages have to pass through those edges. So you know, everything gets piled up, and there's a big uh, traffic jam there. Because then there's no point. You know, then then uh, your, your, your machine is just, just going to sit there idling. So how do, you make, how do you design this, this network so that you use very few edges, but you can guarantee that there are not going to be many bottlenecks, any bottlenecks? OK, 
Okay, so today we are we are going to talk about Eulerian tours. By the way, how many of you have seen this already, Eulerian tours? Okay. Um, the reason we'll talk about Eulerian tours is because, well, first of all, it, it very neatly introduces the concepts that we are interested in. But also, historically, this was the very first use of, use of graph theory. This is, this is where graphs were first defined. In fact, um, when was it? It was back in 1736. By... Leonard Euler. So about 250 years ago. Okay. So the story goes back to the city of Königsberg. So let me make sure I spell it correctly. In Prussia. Okay, and it was, it started with sort of, sort of an amusing, you know, something that uh, the natives of this little town used to do to amuse themselves in the evening. It, you know, it was sort of a quaint little town. There was very little else to do. It was, it was quaint. It was nice to walk through. So that's what the residents did. They'd, they'd walk through it. Okay, but um, uh, in this quaint town, there were, you know, there was a, there was a river with two islands. And there were these bridges. They were sort of very, very beautiful. And there were what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bridges in all. Okay, so there, this was there was the left bank and the right bank, and there were the two islands B and C. Okay, so that was the. That was the structure of this, this, this entire town. The town was on both sides. And what the residents used to do is walk around this, you know, and then over time there was, there was this, this uh, you know, there was this little game that they played where what they were trying to do was actually go on the walk and, and cross every bridge during the walk. But they wanted to do it as efficiently as possible, so they wanted to cross every bridge exactly once. And of course, they wanted to get back to where they started from because you know, that's what you do. You want to go back home. So, so well, that was, that was the little puzzle. And uh, you know, people were trying it for a while, and nobody, of course, uh, nobody succeeded. And um, they were curious, you know, how come nobody, you know, it was sort of a challenge. And so Euler happened to come across this, and, and he realized that what he needed to do as, was abstract out the situation. And once he, ab once he found the right abstraction, he could, he could see very clearly that it was impossible to do this. Okay. So what was this correct abstraction? Well, the way he thought about it was, look, you know, the fact that there are bridges and islands and you know, left bank, right bank, you know, this really doesn't matter. That's sort of irrelevant to the situation. You may as well draw little circles and little lines. So let's draw a little circle for A. Let's draw a little circle for B, little circle for C, little circle for D. And then we say, you know, let, let's draw a little line for each, each of these bridges. So A connects to B with this little line. But there's another one, so we'll put another one like that. And B connects to D with, a, with, with this line, and then there's another one. And then B connects to C, and A connects to C, and C connects to D. OK, so that's, that's our graph, right? So the town goes away, the islands go away, the, uh, you're left just with these circles and lines. Okay, what's the point of that? Okay, so now, given this, what you, what you do is you say, what are you trying to achieve? Well, you're trying to, you're trying to walk around this, right? And when you walk around this, you want to go, go over each of these lines exactly once. You want to start from somewhere, let's say anywhere like this. You want to go over each of these lines exactly once, and then you want to return to your starting point, right? So imagine that you're tracing this. This is a curve. You, you want to trace it using a, using a pen or a chalk. 
And, and what you're interested in doing is uh, tracing it without lifting your, lifting your chalk. So you start from here, and you, st you start tracing, and then you, well, maybe, maybe it's clever to go here, maybe it's clever to go there, maybe it's clever to go here. But now you're stuck, right? If you, if you go back up there, you get stuck. If you go down, well, you're stuck. So first of all, you didn't come back to the starting point. You're stuck somewhere else. Secondly, you didn't traverse this edge. Right? So the question is, can you possibly do this? Can you, can you start your chalk at some, some one of these circles? And can you start tracing everything and return to the starting point? Right? Having traced every, every one of these lines exactly once. And so what, what Euler did was he looked at this thing, he stared at this thing, and he said, obviously, it's not possible. It's completely clear just by looking at it that it's not possible. Right. Do you see that? Do you see why he would say that? You look at island C. Okay, good. So, so there's there's something about you know there's something about these w what what you have to what you have to observe is that is that basically what matters is the number of these lines, which at at each of these circles. You see, because if you're going to do this, if you're going to if you're going to start from somewhere and you're going to you're going to continue all the way through, right? So, so imagine, you know, so, so, so in this thing, you have to, you have to sort of uh, imagine things from different viewpoints, right? So imagine that I am in charge of, of making all this happen. So I, I'm taking care of, of traversing everything, right? You, are, you can look wherever you want. So here's what you could do. You could just pay attention to just this vertex, this, this, this particular circle, and see what do I do, right? So every time I come through, you sort of say, OK, well, it's approaching. And then he left. So what happens? Well, you approach on one, you leave on another. It's always two. right? You come in on one, go out on another one. So you always use up two every time you go through. You've got to use two of these, two of these lines. But there's an odd number of lines. So no matter what you do, there'll be one left over. So the last time you come in, you can't go out. That's true here, too. It's one, two, three, right? So, so if you were watching this one, you would say, well, you know, he's going to come in once, he's going to go out, and then he's going to be stuck. Nothing else to, can happen. What about this one? There's one, two, three, four, five, odd number. You're going to get stuck, right? You can, you can come in, go out. You come in, you go out, you, you're left with that. What about this? Well, here's where you started from. So the first time you went out, Right? That's OK. You, you went out. Now, now you are expecting to come back eventually. You know, you started from there. You, you're supposed to end up back there. Right? So the very last time you come back, that's going to pair up with the time you went out. So that's two. In the middle, if you come back, well, you come back, you go out. So that's two. Right? So what happened here? Well, you went out. Then you, then you came back, you went out. But then, you're s then you never, never got to come back again, right? Because it's an odd number. So that's what Euler was saying. Well, it's an odd, you know, it just consists of odd, num odd numbers here. You need even numbers in order to make this happen. Therefore, it's impossible. Graph theory, right? Graph theory was born on that day. Okay. Okay, that's the origin of graph theory. Okay, actually, he proved not, not you know, okay, he didn't only solve this puzzle. He actually gave a general condition under which you get, you can do Eulerian tours. So this, if we were able to do this traversal of all the edges where we go through each edge exactly once, that would be called an Eulerian tour. And what he said is, here's a very simple condition that you can check easily. And you can actually do such a tour. There's a tour if and only if this condition, is, condition holds. And that's what we'll prove today. We'll see what this condition is, and we'll show that it's necessary and sufficient. All right, so, so before we can do that, 
let's use this opportunity to formally define what a graph is. Visually, a graph is an object which looks like this. Something like that. So you're, you're given a bunch of these little circles which we label with, with A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four, whatever we want. And then we are, we are given lines connecting some of them, okay? So we have these objects, A, B, C, D, and there's a relationship between them. Some, some pairs are related, others are not. So A and B are related, A and C are not. The relationship can be, can be, you know, can be things like there's a conflict between those two courses. It can be there's a, there's, a, there's a wire between these two processors. It's what you want. You know, this is, a, this is an abstraction. This is a way of representing something. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. We are, we are going to. And it'll, be, it'll, it'll take a bit of doing. Uh, so it'll really exercise our understanding of induction and recursion and so on, which is one of the reasons we are doing this. Okay? Okay. Okay, so, so visually, this is what a graph is. But now, if you want to, if you want to write it down formally in language, in, in notation, the way we do it is we say, We'll call this graph G, and it has two sets associated with it. A set V, which we'll call the vertex set, and a set E, which we'll call the edge set. This is a set of vertices, this is a set of edges. Okay. The set V here is going to be these objects, A, B, C, D. Those are these little circles. The set E consists of these lines. So the way, the way we write down this line in notation is we just say that's A comma B, the set AB. It says A is related to B. You put a line between them. Then we have a line between A and D. We have a line between B and C. We have a line between B and D. And we have a line between C and D. So that's our graph. OK? Is it clear? It's just notation, right? The graph is, this is the graph, visually. That's another way of writing down the graph notationally. Right? We, see the, we say that the graph is G, V, comma, E. We identify it with these two sets. Once I, once I specify to you the two sets, you know how to draw this picture because you look up V, okay, there are four vertices, A, B, C, D, so you draw four little circles labeled A, B, C, D. And then you know where, where should you draw the edges? Well, this tells you where you should draw these, draw these lines. Right, so you should draw a line between A and B. You should draw a line between A and D. You should draw a line between B and C, B and D, and B and C. Right, C and D. Okay. So, so you draw all these lines. You reconstruct the picture. If you're given the picture, you can reconstruct this. So they're equivalents. Okay. This is how you might want to think about the graph. This is how you'd input it into the, into the computer. Right. So if you're writing an algorithm, this is how you want to think of the graph. Is that clear? OK. But you see, this, in this graph, you may have noticed that graphs come in two varieties. There were some graphs where we had no arrows, and there are some graphs where we had arrows. So far, I've described to you how to write down graphs which have no arrows. So this was no arrows. This is called an undirected graph.
okay? By the way, actually, I, I also described to you another object which is different from this, which is that one. Because here, we had these little circles, and then we had multiple lines between, between these circles, right? When I write, a, write my edges as a set, I can ha have only one such object. Between A and B, there can be only one line. Because I can't write two such elements within the set. I could write two such elements if I had a multi-set, right? Where you can have repeated elements in the set. You could have two copies of A and B. So this is really, this is called a multigraph. And in this course, we talk about it exactly once to talk about the history of, of graphs. This is, how they were diff you know, this is how they were introduced. And from, from here on out, we are not going to talk about multigraphs. So whenever there's, there's an edge between two vertices, there's, going to be either, there's either one edge or no edge. There aren't going to be two parallel edges like this. Okay? This was just for historical reasons. Multigraphs are useful in, in some contexts, but, you know, but they are, most of the time we talk about graphs, so we are just going to simplify things and only talk about graphs. All right, so now the, the more general situation is one where you, you have arrows on the, on the lines. Okay, those are called directed edges, and so it's called directed graphs. Formally, Okay, so we'll, we'll denote it by again G, V, E. Okay, but now, now, the no, you know, now we can say it a little bit more cleanly. Mathematically, we can say, well, V is a finite set, so we might be, again, okay, so let's do an example. So we have A, B, C, D. Okay, that's our, that's our graph. And now, V is just A, B, C, D. And now E, the set of edges, is going to be a subset of V cross V. Does everyone know what V cross V is? It's a, yeah? It's a set. It's, it's a set. V cross V is just a set which consists of all possible ordered pairs, right? So it would be a comma b, a comma c, a comma d, b comma a, b comma. Well, it it, it ideally it'll also include a comma a, but we, we won't we won't talk about that. That would be a self loop, and we are not going to we are, we are not going to include that. Okay, so, so we might also have a comma a, but, but these we are, we are ignoring inside of, inside of v cross v. So b comma c, b comma d, etc. So you have a subset of these. So which subset do you have? In this case, e happens to be, well, it happens to be the set which consists of the ordered pair a, b. So when we write a, b like this, not in not in parentheses, not in uh, those curly brackets, but in parentheses like this, that means that order matters. So A is the first element and B is the second element. When we put it in curly brackets, it's a set. In a set, the order of the elements doesn't matter. Right? A, a comma B is the same as B comma A. But here, the order matters. And this is telling you that edge points from A to B. Not, if it was pointing from B to A, we'd write B comma A, right? So that's our first edge. There's one from A to D. There's one from B to C. There's one from B to D. And then there's one from D to A. 
It's okay to have edges pointing in both directions, A to D and D to A. Okay. And now we can say that the undirected graphs, undirected graphs are a special case of directed graphs. They are those directed graphs where every time you have an edge from A to B, there's also an edge back from B to A. So you can think of a directed graph as a, as a road network where you have one-way roads. Okay, this happens to be a one-way road, or it could be a flight. You, you, have a, you have a flight from A to B. It doesn't mean that there's a flight back from B to A. Right? You often have these situations where you can go from city A to city B by a flight, but there's no flight back. You have to go, sort of go around in a circle through a, through a different city. Okay, so these, these might be flight paths. Well, hopefully not, because then you'd have a lot of planes stuck at sea, but you get the picture. Right? And so... So the undirected graph is a special case of a directed graph where every time you have a, an edge from A to B, you also have an edge back from B to A. And so then, if you have that, that condition, then we, then we write it in that, in that way. OK? Yeah? Well, we usually use either one or the other. right? We'll either talk about directed graphs, and then we'll use this notation. Or we'll say, well, we are, we are working with undirected graphs, and we'll use that notation. So if you have to use both, then we'll just use this notation. Yeah. Okay. More questions? Let's see. Let me, let me take a short break. Uh, le let, me, let me do some announcements. Uh, let's deal with some logistics, and then we'll go back to talking about graphs and what we, what we want to do there. Then let me just say, we are, we are trying to, you know, we are getting close to the time when we'll finalize the discussion sections. So, so we did a poll to, to try to decide what times are particularly popular in terms of uh, sections. And so it turns out that, um, that 12 to 1 is particularly popular. And so on Monday, we are going to add two new sections from 12 to 1, and we'll see how it goes, how many people actually go to them. So, from 12 to 1, there'll be two new sections. One will be in 3105 Echeverry, and that will be led by Dibya. And there's, there's another one in 3107 at Shiveri. And that'll be led by Alex. Okay. Now, in the meantime, what we are also going to do is we are going to cancel two sections and see how well that works, because those are, those are times where we do not have much demand currently. So the two sections we'll cancel are, oh, sorry, Monday. Oh, yeah, this is, this is all for Monday. We'll cancel three to four, uh, <laughs> three, one, or seven, Echeverry. And, um, and then we are going to tentatively so th at this time, it looks like the demand is really quite low, and we have three sections, and it, you should, you know, if you're going to this section, you have, you have two other sections to choose from at the same time, and there's plenty of space in both of them. Okay? So if, per chance, many of you happen to show up that day, then we can, of course, reverse all this. But uh, you know, in, in some sense, this is your last chance to shop around. And after this, we'll sort of, uh, you know, uh, we, we'll sort of uh, ask you to sign up for sections, okay? So you'll officially be signing up for sections after this. And the, the other one we'll, we'll cancel is, so th these are new, these are canceled, <coughs> at least for Monday, and then depending upon the response, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to update you, and then, then that'll, that'll be it. The other one is 10 to 11, uh, 130 wheeler. Also, Divya. Okay, so so we are sort of moving these and you know moving people around and seeing how to how to work things out so that uh, right. 
Um, so hopefully this will give uh, more balanced sections at the, at the popular times, and uh, hopefully it'll, it'll uh, leave you with, uh, with, uh, um, with many more options to go to. Okay? Yeah. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Okay? Now, uh, one other thing. Um, you, you know, uh, so in terms, of the, in terms of those of you who want to be on the ongoing wait list, I'm actually going to process it by tomorrow. So if you've, if you've not signed up for that wait list, go ahead and do, do so by tonight, and then uh, by tomorrow I'll try to process it. Okay? All right. Um, Okay, so, so let's go ahead and talk about what it is that we'll, we'll be focusing on with respect to graphs. So we are focusing on, in this lecture and the next one, um, sorry, can you settle down here? Okay, so, so what we are focused on in this, in this lecture and the next is one issue, which is connectivity. Okay, so connectivity of graphs. So, so far... We've introduced the notion of a graph. Let's say we, we had that example, which, we, which we'll think of like, okay, so we had A, B, C, D, and we had one, two, three, four, five. You know, that was our graph. Now, of course, vertex one is connected to vertex two directly by an edge. Actually, let's, let's also introduce E and F. Okay, so that's our graph. Maybe even G. Okay, so let's say that's our graph. So, so you could ask, well, how about vertex A and vertex C? Are they connected? And the answer is yes, well, they are connected, but not by an edge. In order to get from A to C, what you might have to do is go from A to B and then B to C. Okay, that, so that's called a path. Path from U to V is a is a sequence where you go from you go from U to W one, W one to W two, dot dot dot, W K minus one to W K, W K to V. So it's a it's a sequence of edges which leads you from one to the other. We'll say it's simple. Usually when, when, we, when we say path, we mean it's simple, meaning we don't repeat any vertices along the way. Right? We just so, sort of go directly. We don't, we, don't, we don't keep looping back on ourselves. If this path is closed, you know, for example, you, 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 you can say, well, maybe somehow what we end up doing is we, we go from B to C to D and back to B. Here you go, B to C to D back to B. So it's, it's sort of a, a path that closes in on, its, on itself. This is called a cycle. Again, simple. Okay. So paths and cycles are how you traverse a, a, path, a, a graph if you're a reasonable, normal, busy person. But if you, are, if you happen to be living in Königsberg, which is a beautiful town, and you happen to be you know, doing a leisurely stroll, and it's beautiful outside, and it's spring, and it's, it's uh, nice weather, then you don't care to do the most, most obvious uh, you know, efficient thing. You really want to maximize the number of streets you walk through. And so then, instead of, instead of taking a path, what you would take is a walk.
A walk is more meandering, so what you could do is you could go from, you know, you might go from A to B to C. I mean, it's up to you, right? Uh, you, you know, it's, it's how you feel, so you might, you might start from A and then you go to, uh, go to C and then, then, then you go along here and, and then you go there. And then maybe you want to go back along this edge, and then you go down here, and so on. It's, it's up to you. You know, you just wander around as you want. That's a walk. Right? You can, you can repeat edges and vertices as you want. And of course, uh, if at the end of this you return to your starting point, then you call it a tour. A tour is a walk that returns to starting point. Okay. And we say a tour or walk is Eulerian if it traverses each edge exactly once. Okay, so you're not, never allowed to repeat edges. You're never allowed to re let, a, let an edge go untraversed. You have to take, take each one exactly once. So that's, it. That's, that's an Eulerian tour if you return to your starting point. If you don't return to your starting point, but if you take each edge exactly once, it's an Eulerian walk. Okay. Now, one last thing about connectivity. If you have an undirected graph, it's either connected or you can decompose it into connected components. So in this case, that's one connected component, that's another connected component, and that's another connected component. And what we mean by that is, in a if these are the vertices in a connected component, you can go from any one to any other by a path. Here you can go from this to this by a path. Here you can go from this to itself by a path, by an empty path. Right? So you can always decompose an undirected graph into connected components. Uh, what about directed graphs? The story is more complicated, and you'll see what you can do with them in 170. It would have to visit vertices more than once in general, right? OK, so now we are ready to prove Euler's theorem. An undirected graph has an Eulerian tour. If and only if let's call it G V comma E has an Eulerian tour. If and only if. Okay. So by the way, you know, when I talk about a graph GVE, sometimes I'll just informally call it G because G is the graph. If I don't want to talk about, you know, so if and only if G satisfies two conditions. So has even degree and is connected up to isolated vertices. Okay, so let me, let me define these undefined terms so far. G has even degree. So the degree of a vertex the degree of a vertex is the total number of edges 
that are incident to it, that are next to it, is equal to number of edges incident to it. Okay, so we say that these, these edges are incident to V because one of the endpoints is V. Or we could also say adjacent to, but incident is sort of a little more... It sounds better, doesn't it? It sounds more technical, so we'll use it. You'll, it, you'll sound like you know what you're talking about when you say it. <laughs> okay. So the degree of this de degree of V is, is equal to 4. Yeah. Okay. We'll say that G is, has even degree if every vertex in G has even degree. G has even degree means every vertex V has even degree. Okay. And what does it mean to say that G is connected up to isolated vertices? What we mean is, well, maybe, maybe G is not completely connected. Maybe there are vertices which, are, which have no edges at all. These are called isolated vertices. These are isolated vertices because their degree is zero. They have no edges at all. But other than these, if you look at the rest of the graph, then it's connected. So you can get from any vertex to any other vertex. Okay. So meaning if you're trying to, trying to trace out all the edges without lifting your pen, the fact that these are isolated doesn't matter, right? You don't even have to go there. Because you're trying to traverse all the edges. There are no edges here. All you need to do is traverse these edges. This doesn't matter. Okay. So that's what Euler's theorem says. Now, when you prove such a statement, and it says if and only if, you have two directions to prove. If as well as only if. Right? So which one is easier here? If or only if? <coughs> By the way, which, which, which direction is which? You know, it's always confusing. So which, which, which one is only if? <coughs> which way? Okay, so meaning this way, what, what does it mean? So you start with the assumption that what, and you're trying to prove what? Yeah. The first implies the second. Only if says, if it is Eulerian, then it must have even degree and it must be connected up to isolated vertices. Does that sound like the easier direction? Surely it is, right? No? Let's try it. Okay, so let's, let's do only if. What this means is, it's Eulerian only if, meaning if it's Eulerian, then these must hold. That's the only way it could be Eulerian. So if it's Euler Eulerian, implies even degree plus connected. Yeah. Do you feel you can prove that? What does Eulerian mean? Eulerian means, so think of it this way. I'm, I'm responsible for s showing you it's Eulerian, so I'm... I'm starting with my chalk. I'm saying, look, here, here are all the vertices. Here, you know, I'm going to trace out all the edges. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and trace and trace and, you know, and trace and trace until I'm, I'm through all the edges and I'm back. Okay? That's what I did. I, I traced. Now, you are responsible for seeing that it's even degree and connected. So what would you do? Well, what you'll do is you're responsible, let's say, for one of these vertices. And you're going to say, I'm going to... I'm going to you know, you, you do your thing, you, you go ahead and you trace out, and I'm going to show you that it's, it's even degree. Because I'll show you that this vertex is even degree, and then no matter which vertex you want, I'll show you it's even degree, but, but just pick any one and I'll show you it is, right? So what, what do we do? Well, I start tracing, and you keep your eye just fixed on this vertex. Just don't worry about e e anything else I do. So I'm, I'm tracing away, and you don't care, you know, I'm tracing, 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 it doesn't matter. And lo and behold, I come here. Now you perk up and you say, okay, he entered here. But he's got to leave. In fact, he does leave. Okay, what, what happened here? Entered on one, left on another. Used up, how much of the degree did I use up? Two. 
OK? And then I come back in. I've got to leave again. How much of the degree did I use up? Two more. So I'm going in jumps of two. Right? At the end of the day, all these edges have got to be taken. So how many could there be? They are either two or four or six or eight. So it's an even degree. Right? What's the only exception? What's the only other case you need to check? The start vertex. Because, because there, as soon as I started, I used up one of the degrees. So I used up one. So you have to hold, you know, you have to hold on to that separately. And then every time I come back in, I've got to leave again. So, so you keep count. Every time it's two and two more and two more. So it's an odd number. Except eventually I've got to end up back here. I've got to return to the starting point. So I get one more there. So the first, the, the, the starting gets paired up with the ending. And then everything in the middle gets paired up every time I go through. So it's even degree. Right? So every vertex is even degree. What about connected? It's obviously connected, right? Because I went through all the edges exactly once. So, you know, I want to get from anywhere to anywhere else. Well, I just follow the tour, and I get to anywhere I want. Except where can I not get to? Well, any vertices that are isolated. Right? Because I, I traversed all the edges. So when I traversed th through this, I traversed all the edges. So what can be left? There could be other vertices left, but there can't be any other edges left. So th these must be isolated vertices. So it's connected up to isolated vertices. We are done. Okay, so only if is done. Now, what we are left with is if. Okay, that's the harder direction. Right? That's really the, where, the, where Euler's theorem comes in. By the way, when Euler proves, proved this theorem, you know, he was a great man, but he forgot connected. You know, he forgot to add in connected because, you know, it's early days, you don't get everything right. Even if you're a great, you know, you, you come up with great concepts, you're a great mathematician, but you, you don't always get everything right. So he didn't. He, he forgot to say connected. And in, in his proof, you see him squirming and sort of, you know, not quite saying it, but maybe he knew it, but he didn't say it. Well, you know. Okay, so. All right, so now we say we do the if part of the proof. If meaning if, it's, if it has even degree and is connected, then it must be Eulerian. Then we can, we can trace through everything. Okay? So how are we going to do this? We're actually do going to do this by giving an algorithm. And the kind of algorithm we'll give is, is a recursive algorithm. Okay, so we are going to give a, give a, so we are going to give a recursive algorithm Euler, which takes as input a graph and a starting vertex, and it's going to output an Eulerian tour through this through this graph. Okay. Now, in order to, in order to write this algorithm, we're going to first write a subroutine. And the subroutine is what you'd expect. Okay? It's, it's going to be called find tour, which takes as input a graph and a, an S. And it's, it's what you might imagine should be Euler. You know, naively, this is what you might, might be your first attempt at, at creating this, this algorithm Euler, the program Euler which actually outputs the Eulerian tour. So naively, what would you do? You'd say, well, look, let me start from S, and let me start walking. So, so I start walking, I go, go somewhere, and then I take another edge which is not traversed, and I traverse it, take another edge that's not traversed, and I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going, and hopefully by the time I'm done, I've traversed everything. OK, I'm st you know, by the time I'm stuck, so I, so I keep going until I, until I get stuck, and I hope that this is an Eulerian tour. So how realistic is it to hope that this is an Eulerian tour? What could have happened? So you started from S, you started taking edges, and you, you kept taking edges until you, could, you know, until you got stuck. 
and you got stuck because you ended up somewhere, I, anywhere, you ended up somewhere where you couldn't take another edge out. Where could you get stuck? Where's the only place you could get stuck? The starting point. Why is that? Why couldn't you get stuck here? Or, or here, or somewhere else? Even, Even degree. So everyone see that you can't get stuck anywhere else? You see, because every time you enter, you use an odd number, you know, think of just what you did before, where as we are walking, you only keep track of this vertex. Every time you enter, you've used an odd number of edges. The first time you enter, you've used one edge. When you leave, you've used two. Next time you enter, three, four, right? So every time you leave, you've used an even number of edges. You started with an even degree. So you're left with an even number of untraversed edges. Right? So next time you enter, it's an odd number, so odd number left over. An odd number can never be zero. So you always have a way to exit. Right? What, a, what a great argument, right? You know you can exit because you've taken an odd number of edges. The total number is even, so there's at least one left over. Right? So you can't get stuck. That's the only place you can get stuck. Okay. So you have some tour. It's not necessary, but, but I'm going to claim it's not necessarily Eulerian. Why not? What could you have missed? You see, because along the way, there can be any number of other edges here. Maybe there's this edge. And maybe there's this edge. And maybe there's this edge. And maybe there's this edge. Right? These could all be there in the graph. And maybe we missed them. We just, didn't, we just didn't take any of these. Because it was perfectly legitimate for us to go, go here, then go here. We could have gone there, but we chose to take this one. It was untraversed. And then we could have taken this one instead of that one. And we came here, and we could have taken, you know, we could have taken that, but we, we chose to take that. We could have gone back, but we didn't. We came here, and then we got stuck. Right, so, so we got stuck. We didn't traverse everything. Right, so we got a tour. We didn't get an Eulerian tour. So what do we do now? Yeah. Eulerian tour. Okay. So, so how do we think about it? You know, now we want to sort of, are we are we in a place where we can sort of wrap it all up and do one more thought and say, okay, our algorithm is done. So, so once you think, you know, once you have the right way to think about recursion, recursion is extremely, extremely powerful, right? And so, if you think about this the right way, we are almost done now. Okay, we, we, we just need one more idea, and then we are done. And we can write the program, and it's going to be nice and short, except maybe analyzing it will be a little bit of an issue. You know, recursive algorithms are like that, right? They are very short, very pithy. And they solve the problem, and it's, uh, it's like magic. Right? So let's see if we can do that. So what are, what are we trying to do? Well, we say, OK, here's, 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 our, here's what we have done. We started from S. We have some, we have some Eulerian path. OK? We have some Eulerian path. No, not Eulerian. We have, some, we have some tour. It's not necessarily Eulerian, which means that there might be parts of the graph we haven't traversed. There may, may be lots of edges we haven't traversed. In fact, there might even be vertices we haven't, we, haven't, uh, we haven't seen. So for example, it could be that there's a whole part of the graph here which we haven't even seen. Right? Th that could be hanging off of there. We just didn't even see it. We could have gone there, but we, we chose not to. I mean, this thing could be arbitrarily large. We just didn't see it. Right? Do, you, do you see that? There could be other pieces hanging off of here, and we didn't see them. OK, so, so what's our real picture? Well, we could, we could say, well, OK, this is part of the graph, but then there are other pieces that are hanging off of here. They might look like this. You know, there's, there's some piece that's hanging off of here, some piece here, some piece here, some piece here. OK? And now what I can do is I can say, let me take the, you know, let me look at this entire graph. I'm going to take out all these white edges, the ones in the tour that I found. And I'm going to remove them. What happens? Well, 
my graph is going to fall apart into connected components. Remember? Connectivity, right? Any graph has connected components. So we started with a connected graph, but now once we've removed these edges, it's going to fall apart into, it's going to be some, some old graph. It's going to have some connected components. Maybe it has four connected components. What else can we say about it? What can we say about the degree of this graph? It's even. Why is that? One in, one out. I'm sorry? One in, one out. Yeah, well, because, because you see, what we removed was a tour, meaning at every vertex it has even degree. It's a tour, meaning every time we entered a vertex, we left it. So it, at that vertex, we, we ent you know, if we entered it twice, we left it twice, so it has degree four. So we removed four edges, or we removed six edges, or eight, right? In any case, we always removed an even number of edges. We started with an even number, we removed an even number, we are left with an even number. Right? So this, this connected component, if you look at it by itself, what's left over is even degree, it's connected, it's Eulerian. What about this one? It's even degree, it's connected, it's Eulerian. Even degree, connected, Eulerian. Same thing here. Isn't this crying out for recursion? Right, this is the, how, how much more of an invitation do we need? Really? Okay, so you've got to get yourself in a mindset where this is all the invitation you need. In fact, less than this, but, you know, okay? So, at this point, it's crying out for, for, for recursion, right? Because you, because you want to say, recursively solve this. Get an Eulerian tour here. Get one here, get one here, get one here. And then what do you do? Then you splice. Right? What, what does that mean? Well, okay, so, so you, you start from some vertex here. You know, there, there's some common vertex. You go ahead and find, find your Eulerian tour here. Find your Eulerian tour here. Find your Eulerian tour here. And find your Eulerian tour here. Okay? And now having done this, what you do is go ahead and splice these tours together. What does that mean? You start from here, your original starting point. You start going along this tour. First time you reach, reach this one, you go ahead and follow this tour. Okay? Having picked up this tour, then you keep going along, along your original tour. First time you reach another one of these components, you now go ahead and pick up this tour. And now you keep going. First time you reach this, maybe not from here, from here, you go ahead and pick up this one. And then you keep going. First time you reach this, you pick up this one. And you keep going, and that's it. That's your oil area tour. You, you need to find a tour. Yeah. So how do you find a tour? Well, you did this. You started from S. You started walking. At every step, you take, a, take an edge that you haven't seen traversed before. Just keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. Okay. Where, where d and stop when you can't do, it, do this anymore. I claim that's a tour. Why? Because the only place you can stop is at S. Why? Because of even degree. Remember we argued this? The only place you can stop is at S. So that's your fine tour. Okay, that's your helpful subroutine. That's what we started with. And we said, maybe this finds us an Eulerian tour. But then we noticed it doesn't, right? It misses out stuff. But okay, it at least finds us a tour to start with. So now we take out this tour. We decompose the graph into connected components. Then we say, recursively find Eulerian tours in each one. And then we splice. And that's it. That's the end of the algorithm. Okay, yeah. That's true, yeah. Okay, so, so now, how do we prove that this works? So 
It's a proof by induction on the size of the graph. We have what's the size of the graph? It could be number of vertices, it could be number of edges. It's actually easier to think of it as number of edges. It, you can do it with either one. It, it works with either one, but let's do it with number of edges. Okay? So base case is trivial when the graph is empty. Okay, trivial. Induction hypothesis. This algorithm works whenever you have an you know, even degree connected graph with at most m edges. At most m edges, which means we are doing strong induction. Right? Because we are assuming it's true whenever you have at most m edges, not just for m, but less than or equal to m. And then induction step. So we start with a graph with m plus 1 edges. And it's even degree plus connected. And now what do we do? Well, we find tour. We find tour. Well, it finds us a tour with, of course, at least one edge. Okay. So we find some tour. And now the rest of the graph splits up into connected components. Each of these connected components is how big? How many edges could there be in them? Certainly no more than m. It's actually smaller than m, but it's certainly no more than m. By the induction hypothesis, when we do the recursive call, it finds us an Eulerian tour in there. Okay, so we find Eulerian tours in all of these by the induction hypothesis, and then we can but the splicing works, and therefore we find a Eulerian tour in the whole thing, right? So, so fine. So, so our, our proof says find tour works finds a tour with greater than or equal to one edge. Certainly greater than or equal to two edges, but certainly greater than or equal to one edge. Therefore, connected components. have less than or equal to m edges. Therefore, by the induction hypothesis, the recursive calls are correct. So they work correctly to give us Eulerian tours back. And now we are done. We can splice them together, and then we are done. Right. So the induction works beautifully with recursion, right? To show you that everything works out. You see, so if you want to understand recursion, you've got to understand induction. They go hand in hand. You know, to understand this algorithm, you really need to understand induction because that's the way you understand the algorithm. Okay? All right.